Okay, we'll get started in, in just a minute. Uh, could somebody uh, uh, who's doing it, uh, Zooming today, say something to me so I can make sure I can hear you? Hello. Okay. Hi. Okay. Uh, I'm not hearing anybody. Hello, we're Sharon. here. Sharon? Yes, can you hear me? I see your lips moving. Oh. <laughs> I can't hear you again. Oh, God. Hmm. No. Hello. I think so. Somebody's. A noise. Uh, Sharon, say something. Hello, can you hear me? Great, I, I hear you. That's uh, that's uh, good to hear that people are there. All right, we'll get started in just a moment. This is a little weird to come into the same classroom, uh, same class, different people. Uh, yeah, this is the first time you've been here, as, as you know. Uh, so it's another example of how this is a, a weird, uh, I shouldn't say weird, it's an unusual time. And when you have unusual times, uh, there are opportunities. You may, the first thing you see is the problems but there are always opportunities. Uh, you have to look for them, uh, but they're, they're there. Uh, I know in the spring, when, uh, when I had to suddenly, had two weeks to get ready to teach from home, um, that didn't initially feel like an opportunity. It felt like a problem. Uh, it felt like a whole bunch of problems. Uh, but it was an incredibly useful uh, experience because um, I, I really did not like Zoom prior to that because every time I would do uh, a Zoom session, I wouldn't, I didn't do very many. It's like once every few weeks I do one and, and it wasn't enough to really become comfortable with it. And uh, after you know, finishing out the spring semester, I, I felt pretty comfortable with it. And I figured out how to uh, draw graphs without using a whiteboard. Uh, a lot of things I did not know how to do, but I had the time to figure it out. And uh, uh, Zoom still uh, likes to throw up uh, unexpected uh, things, uh, but uh, generally they're, they're not too bad. So, and uh, you know, when you are, are uh, most likely when you start, uh, when you're looking, for, you graduate, you're looking for a job, uh, probably things will be different from the way they are now, but things are not gonna go back to the way they were. Uh, Zooming is gonna become, uh, I think, a, a much more important part of, of our daily life than it used to be. Because, you know, I think about uh, uh, my, uh, my pastor, you know, he didn't want to have anything to do with with Zoom online communication. That was just that was not him, just not him. And uh, because of this, uh, he didn't have any choice. And now he's pretty comfortable with it. And once everything goes closer to normal, he's not going to forget the things he's learned. And so you know, look at it as a all of this as a learning opportunity. Uh, and uh, uh, I think looking back in the future, we will see a lot of things that we did learn technologically and just in terms of how to solve problems, how to deal with difficulty. Those are incredibly uh, important um, things to learn. All right, uh, well, I'll go ahead and call the roll. I'm not gonna call 
the whole role because I, I have uh, looked into the, the Zoom participant list and that works very well. I see everybody uh, who, who logged in and when they logged in and when they logged out. So I'm not going to call everybody's name. I'll just call the people who are, who are here physically, but I know the rest of you are here uh, uh, virtually. And uh, you know, as I said before, you know, that absolutely counts as a thing. All right. Let's see. I'm not sure exactly where to start calling the roll, but uh, if you're here physically, then uh, they present. Uh, Patricia Lewis. Okay. Jocelyn Arso. Bradley Meninger. Hannah Morais. Julio Moreno. Uh, Niam Packer. Here. Okay. Uh, Kayla Ramos. Yeah, if, if I call your name and you are booming, then say something. Uh, Des Dasha Ross. Uh, Marty Sandell. Dylan Spore, okay. uh, Genoa Sires, Joshua Urena, okay. Uh, okay. Marcella, I know you're zooming, uh, Dominic White, Cameron Wilson. Anybody physically present that I didn't call? Okay. Gotcha. Okay. And like I said, for those of you who are uh, zooming, I will uh, have the participant list, and and it will you'll get credit for being here. Um. All right. Today we're going to. Um, review what some of the things we said last time. Uh, what we're doing now is we're kind of getting the big picture, the overview of what economics is all about. Um, the, the book gives you specific terms that you need to know, things like that. But in class, I'm trying to give you a sense of the big picture, the, the perspective of what economics is about, because it is not just a collection of words or concepts. Uh, it's, a, it's a way of thinking. It's a way of looking at the world. Uh, it doesn't tell you. The economic way of thinking does not tell you what is important. It tells you what to look for, things that you might overlook, what to look for, uh, how to think about your opportunities so that whatever you feel is important, whatever ends you want to achieve, understanding economics will help you better uh, utilize the resources that you have. Uh, and I believe that the most important part of economics is, is developing this way of looking at the world, not a bunch of terms and concepts primarily, it's a way of thinking about the world that impacts you every time you really look at any situation. Uh, you, and it will help you to notice things that uh, previously you would not have, have noticed. Last time we began with the, uh, we said the uh, fundamental economic problem. We said everything in economics really begins with one problem. What was that problem? Starts with an S. Scarcity. Everything in economics begins with scarcity. I don't care how many economics courses you take, everything is an implication of 
scarcity. And what does scarcity mean? It just means we don't have enough resources to produce all of the things that we would like to have. And there are extremely important implications that flow from that. It's a very simple idea. You know? It's like you're a kid, you go to the store, you see all these toys you want, your parent says, you can't have all of those things. We have limited income. You got to choose. You can have one or you can have two. You can't have everything you want. We encounter that when we're very young. But the implications are just enormous. And you know, for the rest of your life, if you keep thinking about it, you'll still continue to be learning. Uh, we have a lot of politicians who really haven't learned the implications of scarcity. Uh, you have economists who sometimes get lost in their equations and graphs and statistics and forget what's most important. Uh, so you know, scarcity is where everything begins. We said almost everything is a scarce good. What was our definition for a scarce good? We said that that's not our definition, but that is a good way of determining what is a scarce good. Uh, we said that anything that people want more of than is freely available for nature is a scarce good. Uh, you go to the store, if you went to Walmart and they were uh, trying to sell you bottles of plain air, you wouldn't buy any. Right? Why? because you already have enough freely available from nature. You don't have to pay to get more and you're not willing to get to uh, pay to get more because it's not, air is not a scarce good, it's a what? It's a free good. Uh, we said that the reason you're willing to pay to get a pencil or a calculator or a computer, a hamburger, is because you do not have as many of those things freely available from nature as you would like to have. If we look, if we lived in a world where uh, just, you know, anywhere you go, they're just hamburgers sitting there on the ground, free, exactly what you want, then you would not go to McDonald's and pay for a hamburger. But because we don't have enough of those things freely available from nature, people are willing to pay for them. So our quick and easy way to determine what is scarce anything you have to pay for is a scarce good if it's selling for a positive price then it is a scarce good um we said that poverty and scarcity are not the same thing uh, bill gates uh definitely does not live in poverty but he definitely still faces scarcity because in in spite of the enormous uh, wealth that he has, he doesn't have enough wealth to have or to achieve all of the things he would like to achieve. Right? So he's in a very different situation from most of us, but he still faces scarcity. Everybody does. Every person, every society, past, present, and future. That's why we said that scarcity is a universal fact. It's something we cannot escape, we will not escape. We have to deal with the implications of scarcity. And if we recognize that, we'll probably make better decisions than if we don't recognize those limitations. A um, couple of things to point out. Give me just a moment. Okay, um, C 
So what we want to think about the implications of scarcity. We're going to identify three. And you know, all of these things we're talking about in the first um, couple of chapters, especially, there are different ways you can cover these things. There are different way, things you can emphasize. You can cover them in a different order. You know? And I'm not covering it exactly in the order that the book talks about it, but uh, uh, you, the things we're talking about, you're going to find through the book. Things that you find in the book, you're going to find through the lectures, just not necessarily in the same order. When we get over to chapter three and chapter four, I'll be following the textbook pretty closely. But for now, though, I wouldn't try to follow along page by page in the book because I'm not following exactly that uh, order. Scarcity, the implications. First, the cause of scarcity, we have the necessity of making choices. We can have some things. We have resources, we can produce some of the things that we want. We can't have everything. And because of that, it means we have to make choices. And when we choose to have, choose to have one thing, we are choosing to not have something else. It applies to individuals, it applies to uh, societies as a whole. Uh, if you go, if you have uh, $500 in your checking account to last you for a week, well, then you have to make choices. How am I going to, what am I going to spend that money on? Okay. Let's say you don't have any food at home. Okay. Well, you've got to decide. You, know, you can't buy everything you would like with $500. So uh, what are, how are you going to spend that money? If you decide, well, I'm going to, uh, you know, I need a vacation. It's been a tough month. And you, you take a trip to, uh, to Dallas and you stay at a nice hotel and you, you eat out, you can do that. But then when you get back, you find, okay, well, I've got uh, five more days to live and, and I've got $2 left. You can choose to do that. But by choosing to have those things, you were choosing to not have the other things. Um, we can another way to talk about this is that we face trade-offs and we don't we don't really like to think about trade-offs we like to think positively think about you know we're going to do this, what we're going to do we don't want to think about i'm going to do this and that means i can't do this other thing economists remind us over and over that we face trade-offs. Yes, we can choose to do this, but there is going to be a cost. We're going to give up something else. Um, healthcare. Okay? We would love for everybody to have really good health care. If we choose to go in that direction and have better health care for more people, we can do that, but there's going to be a cost. We're devoting more resources to one thing. There are going to be fewer resources for somebody else. We can have better uh, education. We can have more people going to school. But if we do that, there's going to be a cost. Come on in. Uh, housing. Okay? It would be great for uh, everybody to have their own house and to have a bigger and better house than they have now, that'd be great. But if we choose to devote more of our resources to that, then we're choosing to devote uh, fewer of our resources to something else. Well, more of one thing, almost always you can get it, but there's going to be a cost. And economics reminds us, if we want to use the resources that we have efficiently, then we ought to think about what what is the cost when we choose to to produce one thing rather than another. Another implication of scarcity is a need for a rationing 
device. When you ration something, what are you doing? Remember Zoom people? You, uh, you're trying to make it last. You're, you're spreading you're, it out. By sometimes we do ration uh, in order to to spread something out. One of my favorite movies is the uh, The Martian. Did anybody see that? Um, I I just I I watched it. I went to the theater uh, one night and watched it. Went back the next night and watched it. Uh, read the book, listened to the book, bought it on Amazon. Uh, I love it. And here you've got a guy who is, he has limited food and it's gonna be a long time before somebody can come get it. So he did have to ration his food out because if he didn't, then he would be completely out and he would, he would starve. So one reason for rationing is so that things will last for longer. But rationing in general, simply means you're limiting how much uh, someone can get of a certain thing. Okay? And there are all kinds of different ways you can ration. Uh, but the, the idea of rationing is you're, you're limiting. Okay? This is really important. Because of scarcity, there has to be a rationing device. Okay? It's, it's not that we want to ration things. When you ration, you're limiting how much someone can have. But we don't want to do that. We would like everybody to have all that they want. But because of scarcity, that's not possible. So in one way or another, there in every society, there will be some type of rationing device. And there are different kinds of rationing devices. Um, We'll talk a lot more about this over in chapter three and chapter four, but in our society, our type of economic system, what is the primary rationing device? How many of you drive Mercedes? How many of you would like a Mercedes? I would like a Mercedes. I do not drive a Mercedes. Why do you think I don't drive a Mercedes? The price, expensive. it's expensive. The price is very high. In a market economy, the primary rationing device is price. Uh, the price, if, if there's only a small amount available and, of something and lots of people want it, then the price goes way up and only the people who are willing and able to spend that much are able to get it. And anybody who doesn't have that much money or who doesn't value the product that much, they don't get it. They're rationed out of the market. Okay? I'm rationed out of the market for a Mercedes. Okay? Um, that's one rationing device. Okay? Now, if you, and we use, we use that kind of device, rationing device for most things in the market economy. And you might think, well, or a thought that might come into your head is, well, that's not fair. Well, oh, that's an interesting thing to think about. Worth you know, what is fair. That's a, that's a good thing to think about. But right now, we're not saying anything about what's fair. We're just trying to recognize what is inescapable, which is because of scarcity, there has to be a rationing device. There's no choice. There has to be a rationing device. We do have a choice over what kind of rationing device we will use. Uh, price is one. It's not the only one. Uh, in a more of a socialistic system, then uh, you still have rationing because you don't have enough for everybody to have all that they want. But in a more socialistic system, the government makes the decisions as to how who is going to get what is available. Right? And we're not saying one is better than another. Later on, we will see consequences that result from choosing one rationing system or another rationing system. But right now, we're just pointing out every society has a rationing device. It can be price, it can be the government, 
Uh, it can be uh, queuing. What does queuing mean? It's first come, first served. Okay. With back in March, when uh, uh, everybody decided that they needed to buy a whole lot more toilet paper than they normally did, okay. uh, the rationing device was largely queuing. People who got to the store first and filled up their buggy with toilet paper got toilet paper. People who got there later didn't. First come, first serve. Um, you know, one Wouldn't that also be an example of price because the prices went up on it? Wouldn't that also be an example of price? Well, the uh, that's a good question. The price generally, well, once we get in chapter three and chapter four, we'll talk a lot about this. Generally, when you have something like that where the demand increases, generally the price goes up and that's the rationing device. But it's very interesting why prices generally did not go up. And because prices didn't go up very much, that's why you had rationing based on queuing. Okay? We have choice over what kind of rationing device we use. We do not have any choice over whether we will have rationing. There will be some kind of rationing. Um, and in, in a uh, society where um, where you have no government, or at least no government that uh, can exercise any control, uh, what kind of rationing would you have? Okay. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Well, that, that can be the case. What if you are, you're waiting in line at Walmart for it to open or for them to let you in, right? So it is queuing. Uh, what if some, there, what if you have no government? That means you have no police, that means you have no laws. Somebody comes up with a baseball bat, says, that's my toilet paper get out of my way. Well, if they're big enough and strong enough and they have big enough fat, they get the toilet paper. It is very important to rec recognize that violence is one form of rationing. And we don't see a lot of violence in a civilized society because pretty much the first thing the government does is say, violent competition is illegal. You can't do that. We need to always remember that violence is a form of rationing because if the government does not have the, the power and the ability to stop violent competition, there will be people, there are people who will resort to that kind of rationing. Okay? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry? So Different situations lead to different kinds of rationing. Um, and and just, it, it's complicated what kind of rationing will be used. Uh, what, and we're saying nothing about what kind is best at this point. But we're saying you have to have some kind of rationing. And the, comp, the consequences that follow from each type of rationing are very, very different. Um, question about if, uh, if violent rationing is illegal, then, you know, what happens on Black Friday when you have these sales? That, that's another very interesting question. On Black Friday, you know, the day after Thanksgiving, uh, where they have these incredibly low prices, um, where they have limited quantities, the stores are, um, they really have to think about the fact that people, since people are no longer competing on the basis of price, they're competing on the basis of who gets there earliest and who is willing to push their way ahead and who's willing to threaten other people. So the stores really can get in trouble. They are creating 
a situation in which violence can easily happen and they can be liable for that. Um, and, and most people, you know, they don't think about that. I remember the first time I saw a video of people running through, I think it's a Best Buy parking lot, uh, just running through and, and fighting with each other. And it just seemed so bizarre. And then I thought about it, going, no, it's not bizarre. That is exactly what we should expect. If people aren't competing on the basis of price, they are going to be competing on the basis of something else. And that leads us to the third implication of scarcity. And that is competition. Because of scarcity, we will have competition. A lot of people don't like competition. Uh, but it's, it's not a question of whether you like it or not. When you have a scarce resource, there will be competition for it. And the form of competition depends on the type of rationing device that is used. If you have a, a well-functioning market economy okay, where prices are being used for rationing, then the only way you can compete for something is by offering a higher price. There is a, um, one of my favorite places is uh, Colorado. I would love to have a mansion in Colorado. That would be wonderful. Uh, and I, I saw one on the, the front page of the Wall Street Journal one time, uh, $24 million. Now, if I really want that mansion, in a market economy, how do I compete for it? Well, I have to offer a higher price, which means I have to have more money. So I can, that creates an incentive for me to not spend money on other things. So I'll have more to spend on the Colorado mansion. It also creates an incentive for me to make more money. The way for me to to get the house I want is by earning more. And how do I earn more money? Right? Well, I got to figure out what do I have that I can produce for other people and they'll pay me to provide it. Okay? So in a market economy, it has a huge effect on incentives, it has a huge effect on competition. For me to get my mansion in Colorado, I've got to figure out how do I give other people what they want in more of a socialistic system where the government's making the choices. In that such system, I had to figure out who is the, who is the government official who decides who's going to get that house and how can I, what can I do to become buddies with that guy so that he'll let me have that house, right? Under a more socialistic system, you have an incentive to figure out how can I get government to give me what I want. In more of a market economy, you have an incentive to pay a higher price, which means you have an incentive to, to get more money, which means you have an incentive to find ways to sell your services to other people. You have to please other people to get the money so that you can get the items that you want. We're, we're touching a whole lot of things here, but so many things are related and hopefully you can see everything is starting from scarcity. If we come to class next week and I say, well, something happened and I can't believe it, but scarcity doesn't exist anymore. Well, then they, we, we would just stop class because there would be nothing to study, but that's not gonna happen. All right questions at this point. Okay. Um, I did want to spend a few minutes uh, touching on some of the big ideas that um, the book list in chapter one. Uh, I won't touch on all of them, but, but you know, these are really, really important ideas. And some of them we've already talked about. Uh, number one, Incentives matter. Incentives affect behavior. You remember the story about the, the captain of the ship 
What was that story? The prisoners? What happened? What was the problem? Big, big problem. You had uh, English ships that were taking prisoners, I think, to Australia, uh, and most of them would not be alive when they got there. Big problem. And somebody figured out, well, hey, what if we um, pay the captain, not based on how many prisoners go on the ship, but how many, based on how many are alive once they get there. And when they made that change, it was a huge change in incentives because now, think about it, that did not make the captain a better person. Not at all. This was appealing to his self-interest because before the change, he had no, it, it didn't benefit him to keep these people alive. After the change, he benefited from keeping them alive. So it didn't make him a better person, but it improved his uh, behavior, improved his treatment because it gave him an incentive to make or to uh, treat these people better. Okay? Economics is not about trying to make people better people. Now trying to do it, that's, that's a commendable thing. Okay? Uh, a person's character is really important. We're talking about Adam Smith. He believed that uh, what kind of person you are is really important. But in economics, we don't believe that economics, the economic way of thinking, doesn't make people better, but it does improve, tend to improve the way are important and a lot of those prisoners survive because they changed the incentive structure and that led to better uh, treatment of those people. Um, Adam Smith, oh uh, just a uh, current example, the uh, The, uh, um, as a result of the, uh, the uh, shutdown, uh, re government response to the pandemic, uh, uh, we, you know, national output dropped significantly uh, and unemployment went way up. And so the government wanted to do something to help people. And one of the things that they did, the federal government enacted a $600 per week unemployment benefit from the federal government. So if you're unemployed, then you could get an extra, not just unemployment payment from the state, but you could get an extra $600 per week in unemployment benefits. Now, it, <clears throat> things like this are often hard for people to think about because if you're unemployed and you're having financial problems, the first thing you think about is, this is a great idea because it's gonna help me. It's very hard to be objective when we think about these things. Economists try to be objective. And what would you think from what we've said about uh, economics so far, $600 unemployment benefit per week. What do you think an economist would point out about that? I'm sorry? That one thing that uh, economists would point out is that, well, there's a cost. And so the money that we're giving to these people, that could have been given to somebody else. That is a, absolutely an important thing we would, we would point out. Where are they getting the money from? Where are they getting the money from is one of the uh, great questions uh, that people ask. Uh, roughly, the US economy produces 20 
uh, trillion dollars worth of output in a year. And the last I saw, I think the federal government has spent an additional $2 trillion uh, things related to the, the pandemic. So an obvious question is, where are they getting this money? Is the government rich? Nope. No. <laughs> Very concise answer. No, the government is not rich. The government is not your rich uncle who well, has money he can just give you. Okay? The government is um, a very, very, very large debtor. The government borrows trillions of dollars each year. Okay? So how can the government give an extra two trillion to people when they're already borrowing money? Okay? They're printing more. Well, people often say they're printing more money. Technically, that's not, not correct. They're, they don't print the money. Uh, it's much easier. Okay. It's much easier. The Federal Reserve, we, we can only spend a second on this right now, but we will come back to it later. Okay. We will see that there's absolutely no difficulty with the government using the Federal Reserve to give people money. Okay? They can create as much money as they want to. The question is, what will the consequences of doing that be? That's kind of always the question, no matter what the issue is. Yes, we can do this, but what consequences will result from it? Yes, we can give uh, unemployed people an extra $600 a week in unemployment benefits. But what will the consequences be? That's the question often people don't ask. But that's the question economists say, hey, we, we need to think about this, right? Because those consequences will arrive at some point. Right? Now, as far as the, uh, where are they getting all this money? Uh, how do they create it? We can't get into that yet, but I promise you, we will get into it, chapter 34, chapter 35. You will see how the Federal, Federal Reserve creates money. They have absolutely no trouble doing that. You will also see if they create too much money, then we get inflation. Prices will go up. Okay? How high can uh, the inflation rate be? Well, uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, a few years back, they had an inflation rate of 531 billion percent a year, uh, which means basically you get money today and tomorrow it's worth almost nothing. And in a week, it is worth nothing. Okay. Am I saying that's going to happen? No. Uh, inflation may not go up. We don't, we're, this is a time of great uncertainty, but in chapter 31 and 32, we will see why it is that all this money the Fed is creating could increase the inflation rate, could cause prices to go up, or it's possible that they won't. So we, you know, I can't give you a definite answer what's going to happen, right? but we will have a model where we can see, uh, we'll know how to think through it. Uh, and I will point you to some uh, some people that I think are are uh, very knowledgeable and trustworthy, and I'll tell you what what they are expecting. Uh, I'm sorry. Consequences that you speak about are they the same for black? The consequences that you are speaking about are they the same um, for like the big pharmaceutical companies and the big businesses? Are those the same type of consequences? Well, the, the consequences, anytime you have uh, an action, you're going to have a whole range of consequences. And some people are, most of the time, some people are going to benefit and some people are going to be hurt. Even for something where most people say, yeah, this is a good thing to do, there are going to be some people who are hurt. And even for policies where most people would say, this is a bad idea, there are going to be some people who benefit. So most of the time, we can't say this is good for everybody or this is bad for everybody. 
there's a range of consequences uh, and you have to go into the details of the particular action to, uh, to really assess what's going to happen. Um, but getting back to the $600 per week, the first thing I think that an economist would think is, well, if you are telling people we're gonna give you an extra $600 a week to be unemployed, you are affecting their incentives. If I tell you um, next week, um, I'll give you $600 if you don't come to class. Uh, you know, I'm changing your incentives. Okay? Now maybe you just love the economics and you're gonna be here anyway, or maybe you're so afraid you're gonna fail that you're gonna be here anyway. But I guarantee if, I, if you were offered 600, if everybody was offered $600 to not be here, <clears throat> some of you wouldn't be here. It would change your behavior. And so, I mean, there's no doubt this has an effect on incentives. That doesn't necessarily mean that it was a bad thing to do. Right? Um, it, it helped those people. Right? But there's no doubt that it did create an incentive for people to uh, be unemployed um, for longer than they otherwise would be. Right? Um, <clears throat> The uh, second big idea, good institutions align self-interest with the social interest. Um, one of the interest institutions we will talk about is, is private property. That you, in a society where the government uh, passes laws and government enforces those laws, then when people have property, then they have a... Um, reason to expect they're going to be able to hold on to that property. And that has a huge effect on incentives. Think about it like this. I'll find my... Uh, guess what that is? That's my mini man. It has a very heavy tree on it. Okay? Very heavy. I put, I thought, you know, well, I will just push it off. No, no, it didn't move at all. Uh, and when one of my neighbors brings his chainsaw, I think, ah, oh, saved. He can, you know, he can uh, take care of this. You know, he works on it for a long time and says, no, my chainsaw isn't big enough for this, for this tree. So what am I going to do? Well, this is a guy named Hugo. He does our uh, yard work. Hugo provided a service to me. Why do you think he provided that service to me? He got paid. He got paid. He could have said, you know, you know, look, we fix, we do your yard every week. You know, obviously you got a problem here. You know, don't want to take advantage of you. I'll, I'll take care of the tree. No charge. He could have done that. Okay? It would have been great if he did that. But was there any reason that he should have? I mean, there were people, I live in Natchitoches, there are people all over Natchitoches who wanted his services. And they would have paid him just as much or more than I did. Okay? Uh, he said, oh, for $600, I will take care of this tree for you. And I said, and I thought about what is this worth to me? And I decided, yeah, it's worth more than $600. So I accepted his offer. He takes care of my tree. That wouldn't have happened if we didn't have private property. Because we have a system where when I hand him that money, it's now his $600. He can do whatever he wants with it. If we didn't have private property, then I could give him the $600. He takes the tree away. Then I pull out a gun and say, give him my money back. Now, if he thought I was going to do that, he wouldn't take the tree away. He had an incentive to take the tree away, 
because he was confident that when I said, yes, I'll give you $600, I would do it. And he was confident that he would be able to hold on to that money and he would be able to use it to buy whatever he wanted for his family. And once he bought it, it would be his property and somebody couldn't come on and steal it from him. In a society where he thought, there's no point in me collecting any, uh, having money or getting property because somebody will just steal it, then he would not have come and done the hard work required to take that tree away. So I benefited from the institution of private property. Without that institution, Hugo would not have had the incentive to take my tree away, and I would probably still be sitting at home saying, how am I going to get my other car out of, out of the driveway? Okay. Institutions are very, very important because they, they create um, incentives. And we'll be talking, these are things we'll be talking about throughout the course. Uh, big idea, three trade-offs are uh, everywhere. Think about safety. We think a lot about safety now. Do we, should we do everything that will make us safer? I'm sorry? We lock our doors, but when you lock your door, does that, does that mean nobody can get in? No. And, and you, well, you put three or four locks on your door, okay? That will make you safer, but still there are people who can get in even though you have three or four locks. You can have a um, uh, uh, security service so that the alarm goes off. But, th and that makes you safer, but still there's a danger because there are people who know how to uh, uh, disable your security. You can have an armed guard with you every night. That will make you safer. But still, if you know, 10 people come and try to rob you, you're not going to be safe. Okay? We tend to think in terms of all or nothing solutions. Do we want to be safe or unsafe? Okay? But the reality is most of our decisions are marginal decisions. We decide, do I want to be a little more safe okay? or a little less safe? Okay? We decide, do we want a little more of this or a little less of this? Think about your you're driving down the road. The uh, speed limit is 75, okay? You're not gonna get in trouble for breaking the law, okay? Are you gonna drive 76? If you drive 76, you yes. get there a little bit faster, okay? But there's some possibility you could get uh, a ticket, and okay? there's a cost to that. So do you drive, you increase your speed to 76? Well, there's a little benefit there's a little cost. If you perceive the benefit to be greater than the cost, then you go up to 76. What about 77? You, uh, you, you may choose to do that. What about 78? What about 80? What about 110? Right. You're making a marginal decision. You want to go a little bit faster, a little bit slower. Right? And the faster you go, the more benefit you get in that you get where you're going faster, but the expected cost gets higher and higher. Right? Not much extra cost going from 75 to 76, but when you're going from 76 to 110, there's a, a huge extra cost. Right? That's a good example of marginal decision making. You don't decide when you get up in the morning, well, am I gonna stay home or am I gonna drive 110 miles an hour? you make a choice, you make a series of choices, and one of them is how fast am I going to go? Um, think about COVID-19. Okay? We tend to think in terms of, you know, we're, we want to be as safe as possible. No, we don't. It's just, uh, people don't like to acknowledge that, okay? But the safest thing for you to do, if all you're concerned about is COVID-19, is to do what? Go home and don't leave your house. There, there's no doubt 
that that is the way to minimize your chance of giving, getting COVID-19. But the cost of doing that would be rather high. And so you've all chosen to come out of your house, come to school. Okay? Is there some risk? Well, yeah, just like in any year. You come out, you may get the flu. Okay? You may get something else. Okay? Um, life isn't safe 100%. So we make these choices about how safe do we want to be. Okay? Uh, and we make those choices based on what are the benefits and what are the costs. It is an incredibly simple idea but people forget it, and sometimes people react against it. They want to live in a safe world. And that's just not the, the world in which we live. We have to make choices. Um, Trade-offs are everywhere. One of the implications of that is the idea of opportunity costs. It's a really important idea we will uh, talk about uh, repeatedly. When we talk about, when you hear the word cost, uh, if you're like most people, you probably see dollar signs. You think, what does something cost? You think, how many dollars do I have to spend to get it? But when we talk about opportunity cost, we're not talking about dollars. The opportunity cost is the highest valued alternative that you give up when you make a choice. Opportunity cost is the highest valued alternative that you give up when you make a choice. Let's say that, um, let's go back a couple of years before anybody knew what the word COVID meant. Uh, and let's say the Saints are in the Super Bowl and you're a big Saints fan, you would love to go to the Super Bowl. Uh, you say, well, I can't, you know, I can't afford the ticket, it's too expensive. Somebody gives you a free ticket to the Super Bowl. Is there going to be any opportunity cost to you of using that free ticket to see the game? Of course, to go to the game, you're going to have to get there, and so you're going to have some costs associated with uh, travel and such. But let's just keep it simple. Let's say you live right across the street from where the game is going to be played. So it's just, you know, walking. It, it, travel cost is essentially zero. Okay? Is there any opportunity cost to you of using the ticket to see the game? You didn't pay anything for it. No. I'm sorry? You're not giving up anything. Is that true? Well, you might miss work or something, so you may miss work that day. You, you do have the, the opportunity cost of your time, because okay? if you're at the game, then you, you're not working, okay? uh, that, and that's relevant. Okay. Well, let's just focus on the opportunity cost of using the ticket. Okay. You're thinking, oh, this is great. I can, I can see the Super Bowl. It's not going to cost me anything. Day of the game comes. You are walking through the parking lot. You're about to go into the stadium. Uh, you got your tickets with you, you know, 50 yard line. You know, great, great seats. You're thinking how wonderful this is. And right before you go in, somebody comes up to you and says, I will give you $15,000 for that ticket. Is there an opportunity cost of using that ticket? Yes. Yes. There's a $15,000 opportunity cost. You didn't pay anything for it, but that is, that's irrelevant. Okay? It's what can you use that, uh, what is your alternative use for that? ticket and somebody's willing to pay you fifteen thousand dollars that's the opportunity cost of using it you can still use it okay? but you can't tell yourself uh it didn't cost me anything okay? 
you would you should think about well fifteen thousand dollars what could i have bought with that fifteen thousand uh, dollars a car a vacation there's something you would have bought with it okay whatever you would have bought with that money that is the opportunity cost of using the ticket that you didn't have to pay anything for okay? what does it cost to charge your cell phone you hook it up to electricity the, you use electricity uh and so you know there's there's a you pay something for that that's not going to be very high but what if you what if you decided to run your car and and you know it's gonna let's say it's gonna take three hours to charge it up from your your cigarette lighter you run your car for three hours just to charge your cigarette lighter is there an opportunity cost of doing that gas battery you're using up a lot of gas you're using up a lot of gas that's true uh but is there an opportunity cost of using that gas not always most of the time certainly you know you think you use your gas you say i gotta replace that gas okay that's not always the case my minivan uh had a full tank of gas and i tried my best to siphon the gas out i couldn't get it honda has a security feature so that people can't steal your gas but it also means you can't siphon it out so what did it cost me to run my minivan for three hours zero opportunity cost i was burning gasoline but that gasoline could not be used for anything else now under normal circumstances the opportunity cost of that gas is what you would have to pay to replace it. Okay? But the really important point here is that opportunity cost varies from one situation to another. Okay? And so in this unusual situation, there was no opportunity cost of using that gas. If you learn to think in terms of opportunity cost, then you can start looking at situations and thinking about opportunity costs. You may see a building that's only being used one day a week. And you think, you know, that building, maybe I could rent that building another day of the week and maybe I could use it to produce something. The opportunity cost to them of renting it to me during the, on those other days may be very, very low. They might rent it to me at a low price uh, I could use it to produce something. Look at the resources that you see as you go through life. Look at the things that, that belong to you or the things that you could purchase from somebody else. Think about opportunity costs. Uh, you can, uh, there's no telling where that will, will take you. Um, big idea for thinking on the margin. We've already uh, really talked about that. Uh, that's really important to, to remember. Most of our decisions are not all or nothing decisions. It's a matter of how much do we want of something. And we make those decisions based on comparing what are the extra benefits, what are the extra costs. Um, B idea five, the power of trade. This is an incredibly important idea. It's I guess the simplest idea in the whole course. And that is that when people trade with each other, both parties benefit. Um, we say that trade we say that trade is mutually beneficial. both parties benefit. The path to prosperity is trade because trade is mutually beneficial. The producer benefits and the consumer 
benefits. If, the, if, if I go to a store and the producer is offering me an exchange that's not going to benefit me, what do I do? I don't buy from him. I only buy from him if I'm going to benefit. Choose another option. I'm sorry? I was saying you choose another option. That's right. If, if I'm not going to benefit, I choose another option. The producer, if he's not going to benefit from selling to me at a certain price, he won't offer to do it. When a trade occurs, it's because it's going to benefit both parties. That's an incredibly important idea. And it's an idea that some people resist. I have a friend who, who just absolutely resists that idea. He says, last time you went to Sam's, what happened? Well, I left with a buggy full of stuff. See, they won. That's exactly what they wanted you to do. Right? And the correct response is, yes, when I left with a buggy full of stuff, Sam's did win. And I did win. Okay? We both benefit from trade. Trade is not uh, like a war. Okay? In a war, you, you, don't, you don't look at a war and say, well, who won the war? Well, they both did. No, you have a winner, you have a loser. Trade is not like uh, an athletic event. When's the last time you went to a football game? And somebody says, well, who won? You're, oh, well, they both won. No, the nature of the event is that you have to have a loser. You cannot have a winner without a loser. And lots of people think of trade, they think of economics as being like a war or like an act, uh, athletic event. And when you think in those terms, you are absolutely using the wrong frame. You are using a frame that will lead you to bad conclusions. Okay? Um, one of the, uh, we, we are not going to get into politics in this class, uh, but we will talk about economic policy. <clears throat> and one of the uh, uh, difficulties with our current president is his views on trade. He talks about trade as if it is a fixed sum game, as if it's like a, uh, uh, an athletic event. Right? Somebody wins, somebody loses. And you know, that is absolutely the wrong starting point. You have to start with, if you want to see things clearly, you have to start with the starting point that trade is mutually beneficial. Now, if somebody is uh, uh, deceiving you, they're, they're, they don't pay you for, for the exchange, or if they are uh, pretending to sell you something and they actually sell you something else, that's something different. That's deception. Okay? Yes, in those cases, uh, both parties may not benefit. But under most circumstances, trade is mutually beneficial. Very simple concept, but extremely important, and lots of people forget it. Number six, the importance of wealth and economic growth. Economists sometimes are criticized. People say, oh, well, the economists are only interested in GDP. They're only interested in money. Okay? Um, no, we're interested in prosperity for people in a country. And we use GDP as a way of measuring how much we're able to produce of the things people value. Okay? But we are, we are not, we're interested in people, okay? not just money. And um, as a society, <clears throat> society becomes more wealthy as they have uh, growth, all kinds of things happen that benefit the average person. If you look at um, wealthy countries today compared to low income countries, uh, if you look at life expectancy, if you look at uh, nutrition, you look at literacy, you look at infant mortality, you see that the countries that have a, a higher GDP, more developed, 
are, the people are better off in all of those ways. So when we talk about the importance of wealth, we're not saying we really want to do things so that Jeff Bezos and, and people like him will become more wealthy. Okay? Um, that's just kind of a byproduct. Okay? When we have a productive economy, then everybody generally benefits from that. And if you compare the, the poorest people today with the poorest people in, in uh, more socialistic countries or with the poorest people uh, from the past, the poor today are dramatically better off than they were in the past. So we should always focus on uh, what can, I would say, what can we do so that the average person will become better off in the future than they are in the present. And, uh, this course will help us to uh, identify things we can do. Uh, institutions matter. We've already talked about that. Um, big idea eight, economic booms and bust cannot be avoided, but can be moderated. Uh, an economic boom simply means a period where the economy is growing at a rapid rate. Okay? GDP is going up. Uh, unemployment tends to be going down. Uh, uh, an economic bust or a recession or a depression, that's a period where things aren't going well and uh, uh, output is going down. Generally, we have high unemployment. This idea is saying these fluctuations, we cannot completely avoid them or prevent them, but there are things that can be done to moderate them so that we have slight recessions rather than major depressions. Um, and we will talk about the things that the government can do to potentially make um, the economy perform better. Um, what we had uh, in the second quarter of this year was incredibly interesting. Uh, GDP dropped at an annual rate, I believe, of 32%. I mean, that is literally off the charts. What do we do in a situation like that? What can the government do? What should the government do? Okay. Those are controversial uh, questions. And in this chapter, or later on in this course, we will present a model that will help us think through reactions that the government can take that uh, potentially may help. Okay? And we'll also see what can go wrong if they do the wrong things. Um, big idea nine, inflation is caused by increases in the money supply. Um, this is gonna be one of the most interesting to think about as we go uh, forward, uh, because the Fed is increasing the money supply a lot uh, you will hear people who say, you know, absolutely, we're going to have more inflation. You'll hear other people who say, ah, oh, that's what people used to believe. That's not true. Okay. We will see that we may have more inflation, but it's more complicated. There isn't a simple answer. Um, but by the time we get to the end, we will you'll have some understanding of the issues that are involved. And then number 10, central banking is a hard job. I referred before to the uh, Federal Reserve. This Federal Reserve is called our central bank. That means it's a bank for banks. Okay? Your bank has an account at the Federal Reserve. What the Federal Reserve uh, does is incredibly important. Uh, in the 1970s, we had a huge problem with inflation. Guess who caused that? The Federal Reserve. In the 1930s, we had a Great Depression. Yes, we caused that to a large degree, the Federal Reserve. So what the Fed does is incredibly important. Potentially, they can make us better off, but if they follow bad policy based on bad theory, uh, millions of people can suffer for a long time. All right, we're out of time. Uh, we will stop here. Um, I will start in on chapter two on uh, uh, trade and comparative advantage next time. Any questions? Oh, I have not put up 
I was going to send you an email asking for information about when you can take the exam. I haven't gotten that done yet. I will have that done by noon tomorrow. So if you could get back to me over the weekend, that would be great. Hi. Sure. Um, so we are at this moment at the same first week of the cycle. Um. Well, this is kind of, um, I guess this would, we're halfway through the second week. Second week? I'm sorry? The second week? Uh, roughly, yeah. Because uh, the, the scarcity and all the, 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 the example of the boat to Australia and all the stuff, <laughs> I, I was working in that this week. Yeah, that that uh, is largely talked about in, in the first chapter. But like I said, a lot of this is it's all tied together, and so the book may cover it in somewhat different way. Um, for the sapling stuff, the uh, I, I sent out an email that um, everything will be everything that's due for the first exam you'll have until uh, the day of the exam to do that, um, and the exam is on the 29th. What's your name? William. William, okay. And uh, the absence of the absence of the first week is going in those subjects? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble. The the absence of the first week are you counting those subjects? Because I, I was not here that week. Okay. Um uh, were you were you um where where are you from? Columbia. Columbia, oh okay. Okay. Uh, so you, you, were you not back from Columbia? Or? No, I, I arrived like the, the one day before the hurricane. Okay. So uh, I had some problems. Well, the, I generally will have uh, kind of give you a, a, cut, a cut you some slack on uh, if you miss a time or two, then I don't really count that against you. Okay. So you don't really need to worry about that. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. See you next Thursday, I guess.